Hello my dear beautiful bastard and better, your glorious lord and welcome back to Cradle. Here we are with our synchronizer on our way to Ida and we must run down this little slide thing. This is very unsafe. So if you visit a real amusement park, you should not do this because it is very unsafe and it can kill you. I know why there was so little information about me. August 15th was my first work day at the Gerbera Garden. I had come here for the first time with that group of kids, and the explosion occurred two hours later. So now we have the night time. Look at the moon. It is so close and so beautiful. Imagine if our moon was this close and this large. Oh, I would love that very much. And imagine if we could see the galaxy like this. Oh, I love space. I'm a big fan of space and, you know, futuristic stuff. So, I really like this. This is very enjoyable. Looking at the night sky in the cradle. It's beautiful. Ida, I am back with the synchronizer. Did you bring it? I did. Hold on while I replace it. Remove the boobs. Oh, we got the boobs again because when you load the game the boobs come back Which is quite convenient That shit can go away and the new one can go in Where are the boobs? Let's put the boobs back on because she looks better with boobs. Let's start her up again Well, it's fine. Thoughts still messed up? No. Then it helped For now, we'll see if it lasts. How long will your charge last? About two weeks, maybe less. Say, know what I found? The correspondence of that operator, Mark, with one of his colleagues. There are some strange tidbits here. Here, listen to this. To be honest, it doesn't really interest me. Wait, this is important. It's about your parents. What? Your parents. And me as well. Here, listen. It's a work correspondence. They're talking about research into memory transfer between people, using telepathy. Telepathy? That's what it says here. They're discussing telepathy and also mentions some kind of side effect. They refer to it as MPR zero, the MPR zero effect. What is it? Well, if my understanding is correct, it's a sensation, a strange sensation experienced when one transmits one's memory. And what of it? Mark writes that at one time he was very interested in the matter, studying MPR Zero thoroughly after that incident with Ida. That incident? We must have been acquainted. Even though I remember nothing about Mark or any unusual effects, and I cannot imagine what incident he's referring to. And what about my parents? That's here too. He recalls working at a research station before the garden was constructed. There weren't many people around in those days, his circle of contacts was limited to several work colleagues and his Mongolian friends. He writes, It's the family living in a yurt not far from the landing platform. That's your family, isn't it? Sounds like it. Where are your parents now? They died long ago. Why? They could have probably answered many of our questions. Maybe Mark even told them about me. Are you alright? Yes, maybe. Maybe he told them. Ida, is everything fine? Everything fine is an ordinary word. Just a note. Like the weather, chilly or warm. But we were looking for other research. Family records. Kind letters. So... What was that just now? More of the same? Yes. Again. Enabish. What? I don't think I have much time. Please, help me untangle this web with Mark. I want you to look through your parents' things. They may have left behind notes. Journals. Understood. I will go look for them. Tabaha is here. Tabaha, I think we need to talk to him, right? Question Tabaha. Let us go question him. Yo, Tabaha. Yo, man. Looks like it'll rain. Rain? Today? There'll be rain and thunder, and it'll sweep all profiteers into a ditch. What happened? You got any idea how much the search cost me? No. How much? One and a half. Is that a lot? Well, 
When and by in Hungor has the internet ever cost one and a half? I'll pay you back. I won't take money from your destitute self. All right. Thanks. The information was paid for and delivered by a personal courier. Very nice. So, what did you find out? Well, first of all, the Gebera Garden was never about entertainment. It was a hospital, I know. But what happened to it? The kids were all patients, yeah? Well, one of them had his container overflow. The passim exploded. That's what happened. That's all? Hold your horses. The story ain't so simple. Think. A person gets his body replaced and blows up minutes later. You might ask, how could they not have checked the container? Turns out they did check, and the container was empty. And yet, 15 minutes later, it up and explodes. In other words, the capsule filled and overflowed rapidly. Pretty much instantly, in point of fact. There must have been a reason. Must have been, sure. But it wasn't found. All that's known is that there was a mishap with this particular child's transfer. Turns out, he had been talking to himself while in the booth. That was the mishap. As to why he blew up, that part's unclear. When he came outside, all his stats were normal. And he looked calm. You can see it on the video. He was talking to himself? What about, I wonder? Nobody knows. The conversation wasn't saved. What's the video you mentioned? From the security cameras. You can see everything. Here he is, coming out of the booth in an M-body. Here's the sword acceptance ceremony. Here he is, getting off the stage and heading into the garden. He's walking evenly, takes a seat on the edge of a flower bed, then this part is a bit unclear. What's happening? A child comes up to him as he's sitting. A teeny little thing. Walks up and says something to him. Looks like the kid fancies the sword and is asking for it. What sword? A toy. Just a shiny toy sword. They were given to the kids as presents after their body replacements. Endure a transfer, get a toy. Okay. Okay. So our hero hands over the sword. He's holding on to the hilt. Hand extended. The child is trying to take the sword, but can't. Why can't he? Because he's grabbing at the blade, which is holographic. The kiddo's fingers swish right through the air, through the illusion. I see. And then what happens? Then, nothing happens. It's the end of the recording. The explosion is coming up. Here's a grown-up approaching the kids. That's the transfer operator. He walks up to his patient and asks him something. The latter turns around and blows up a second later. And that's it. Doesn't clear up much, I'm afraid. What was his name? Mark. Or who are you asking about? The one who blew up? That was Albert. And the other child? The little one? Don't know. He was one of the locals. Not sure how he ended up inside the garden. Uh... Have fun with your little mystery now. But I'm off. See you tomorrow? I don't know. It might be three, four days, maybe a week. We'll see. All right, take care now. Don't get caught in the rain. Hold on, Tabaha. I've got one more question. I told you everything I know about this garden. I got nothing else. It's not about the garden. It's about my parents. I wanted to remember something about my parents. Here. What's this? A key to the drawer of your Grandpa Botchin's bedside table. Where did you get it? Botchin left it to me. He said that if ever you ask me about your parents, to give you this key. So, that's what I'm doing. And I don't know nothing else. Goodbye. Goodbye, Tabaha. Alright, so we got the key. We got some more info about the kids, about the explosion, and... So far, I don't think anyone would understand anything, you know, in any specific way. So we are going to need to explore a little bit more, find out more info. And there are a few things in the yurt that we should check out that help the story. But I don't think I want to do that yet. And also, I'm pretty sure that I will need to make another video, or maybe this one will be a little bit longer. 
I'm not sure. We will see what happens. So now we need to open the drawer. The drawer is... where is it? It's not here, it is on the other side. Where is it? Where is the drawer? Here it is. Here it is. And now we got a flashlight attachment that we need to attach to the flashlight. Oh wait, I don't know that it's a flashlight attachment yet, I guess. So we gotta read. Grandpa Batchin's journal. On the inside are several brief notes. The two pages split by the bookmark are dense with text. It is a message for Anabish. I'll read all of the entries. Well, well, now the home of my son is empty. So fate has decided. I'm not complaining either. Providence knows best. All that's left for me is to pray for them. I'll head out in the morning. It's over 200 miles. Better not forget a gas canister. It'll be dark when I get there. The wake will go on all night, and come morning I'll be gone, leaving everything as is. Providence has got a plan, to be sure, in which my role is a modest one. As for the baby, of course I'll take care of him. I'll take him with me to Ulaanbaatar. I'm not so easily scared. No use guessing now, these parts won't let him go, no doubt about it. Evidently we're destined to live here. What other option is there? Only abandoning him, and that I will not do. He won't drink milk, he won't eat anything. What do I feed him? He's growing so fast. Isn't it early for a two-week-old child to walk on his own two feet? And where did he go at night? I can't figure out what it is he's found. Some kind of a device. Three days now he's been playing with it, dragging it through the dust, gnawing at it. I suppose he's teething. He stopped gnawing, hasn't changed in a week. A five-year-old child is walking around the yurt. Keep walking, son. Your appearance doesn't scare me. But how is it that you look so much like him? I guess that's not for me to know. Providence has got a plan, in which my role is a modest one. My job is to pray. An air shuttle flew by yesterday. It's been a long time since we've seen one. I couldn't make out any people inside. Could it be it's used as fright? What a meeting! Praise Providence, you reckless soul! If it weren't for Anabish, you, Tabaha, would still be lying in that flower bed. But it's a solid, money-making idea. The passage is free, which is always good. The tires on the scooter won't need replacing. I'm gonna sell it. No more notes, only the letter is left. Anabish, if you're reading this letter, that means your curiosity has led you into the past, to your forebears. Your parents' belongings are locked away in chests. I will give you the key with which to open them. But know this, no things will give you any answers until you've asked yourself the right question. Of all the possible paths, only one will lead you to this question. Find this one true path and may my modest assistance ease your search. You will need a ray of phantom light to illuminate your path and a wise clue to make the right decision at the crossroads. In the drawer lies a rounded object, use it to obtain the ray of light. In a book of wisdom you'll find a clue. Then go to my grave, stand on the largest stone and take a look around using the ray of light. Look carefully and you will see the spot from which to begin your path. Alright, so this is the next part, the next puzzle, if you will, and that puzzle can be solved relatively easily, it didn't take me long, so we need to read this here. Collection of neo-Buddhist fables, short morality tales, one of them is carefully circled with a marker. Sitarasana's path. One night in the woods, a girl named Sitarasana had a curious thought. She suddenly realized that she didn't know who her parents were. It can't be that I don't have parents, I must have simply forgotten them and I bet they're waiting for me back home, thought the girl. Pardon me, which way do I go to find my parents' home? Sitarasana asked the vagrant with a malcontent face. If you don't know where to go, go toward the light. That's what I always do, the vagrant replied, shaking soot off of his smoking head. Sitarasana looked about herself. To the east, rays of the rising sun were filtering through the tree trunks. My home must be that way. The girl decided and headed towards the light. The sun guided her path the entire day, but then evening came and it hid beyond the horizon. The moon rose to the firmament. The girl halted momentarily, wavering, then shrugged and started after the moon. But come morning, the moon melted from the sky, replaced once more by the sun. Sitrasana frowned and turned towards the sun. We'll walk until I reach my goal, she decided. Six days and six nights, Sitarasana wandered through the woods, alienating between the sun and the moon and changing direction, until she reached a meadow flooded with a phantasmal light. 
Beg pardon, but where is the light coming from? I see neither the sun nor the moon in the sky, she asked Buddha, who was listening to music streaming from a radio speaker. Buddha stuck his finger in the sky and returned the volume knob to its former position. The girl looked up and saw the stars above. She smiled and thought, what beautiful music. So basically what we need to do is get this little thing over here, attachment on it, and then use it to find... First we need to find the grave, of course. Now the grave is going to be over here. This is the grave. It's actually really, really close. So once we are at the grave, the Bajin, Bajin Dalha, he lived to be 69. Not a lot. So we stand on the largest rock, we take the flashlight, and this is what we need to follow. This illuminated little thing. This is the sun, this is the moon. We gotta follow sun, moon, sun, moon, until we reach our, our destination. So let's go follow the sun. And then we follow the moon, and then sun, moon, sun, moon, sun, moon, sun, moon. Who am I? This is the clue. And we must follow the pointer. It will lead us to this little... Little thing. What is this called? I have no idea. Here you'll find the answer to your question. Who am I? That's right, Anabish. Who am I is the question that leads to the secret of your past. You are but a step away from unraveling the mystery. From the ancient mystifying events whose meaning I never did grasp the end of my days. Perhaps only you are destined to reveal their divine plan. I promised you a key to the chest that store your parents belongings. The key is before you and with it I pass to you that which I had guarded in my memory for many years. Yes, the things in the chests belong to Jambul and Sarnai. However, these people are not your parents or even your relatives. They had a son of their own once, but he had died in that explosion under the dome. He was five years old and his name was Chagatai. Several days after the explosion, a golden eagle arrived here, carrying a human infant. He set the child down on the ground in front of the yurt. You were that infant, Anabish. Who you are and where you came from, I do not know. From that day, the home of my late son became a haven for you and Ongots. I was not repulsed by the strange appearance of your bodies. Who am I to pass judgment on Providence? This may came a month later, when Chagatai's features on your face became unmistakable. Goodbye forever your grandfather Bachin. That's really strange. <laughs> strange shit, man. So maybe he's like some sort of a android cyborg that can grow something. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Seems a little bit strange. So let us open. Open and then we gotta remove all of the useless shit so we can take the... Come on. Go away. Go away. So we can take the second chest. Something else is inside, this little shit. Now I can move it. Go away. Go away. And now we can open this one. So I guess this is the family. Packs of letters. One correspondence mentions Mark and Ida. I've already written you about him. He works nearby at the station. Well, a few years back he met a girl. He says they saw each other only once, in a company of friends, and somehow the way she looked at him, he's been dreaming of that moment ever since. Mark speaks of some strange sensation called the Babylonian effect, and that the entire institute is studying it at the present. Jambul and I laugh in return. The sensation is totally normal, Mark. We've studied it thoroughly long ago. Smiley face. Kick your signs to the curb and go to Ida before she gets her body replaced. So... So wait, what? Mark and Ida were together, so maybe, like, I am the kid, I'm her kid, maybe, right? That might be, uh, <laughs> that might be the case, I'm not sure. Let's talk to Ida again. I found it. 
You and Mark had met once before. Yes, I already know. I remembered it. How? Tell me. It was just after my college entrance exams. My friends and I were hanging out in the city as part of a larger group. Mark was there as well. I hadn't met him before then, nor seen him since. Our paths crossed once, and that was that. So what happened between you two? Nothing at all. We didn't have a single exchange. We all just sat there with the guys on the cafe terrace chatting about this and that. It was your typical evening. Mark was recalling some kind of special moment. Nothing so special that it stayed with me. Except, maybe, there was this strange sensation. A sensation? Yes. Sometimes I get a peculiar feeling. It somehow resembles anxiety, but only partially. I can't really describe it. It is a sad, pleasant feeling. I had felt it again that particular evening, and... And what? Anabish, I'm about to shut down. Wait. We're not done figuring out your past. And we won't. From whom? From my neurochip. Only, the neurochip writes in red letters. I'm being informed that it is self-destructing. Know what I can do? What? Split myself in two. What do you mean? When I shut down, my upper half will split from my legs. Why? I have no clue. That's just how my body works. I can show you. Watch. Wait, don't. Ida, listen. I'm listening. Maybe there's still a way to fix everything. Fix everything? Well, there is a way. If you can travel to the past and pass four digits to Professor Koch, that would fix everything. Fix. Everything. Okay, so something happened. She, she's she's weird now, and everything is weird. Wait, why why am I? No, go go away from me. Stop dragging. Oh, okay. <laughs> everything is fine now. So this is basically the ending of the game, when everything goes to shit. A lot of a uh, lot of rain and thunder. But first, before we do that, I would like to I would like to read a newspaper that will help us figure out what's going on. But where is that newspaper? Let me find it. Here it is. Let's read it. Koch's Code of Salvation, I don't know how to pronounce this shit. Were I given the magical opportunity today to send a one-word text into the past, I would write 3513 and send it to myself. Yes, it is only four digits, but it would have been enough to save our world. This famous quote of Helmut Koch naturally tugs at our heartstrings. Today, when the prospects of returning to our former lives are all but nil, the thought of the chance we had missed torments us all. These days everybody knows the number 3513. We associate it with a spell that could have saved us all, if only it were cast in time. But how is it that four simple digits could have prevented a disaster? Our exclusive interview with Professor Koch, the pioneer of neurocopying, sheds new light on previously unknown details of this tragic story. So something about this code, but I don't know what. Something about the code. So what we need to do is take Ida to a powerful source of electricity and that we can do in the garden and here we are in the garden we need to put her to the right here where on gods is see right here we gotta plop her onto this thing oh, whoops come back come back to me plop her up then we need to remove the back side Go away and take this cable over here and plop it into her back. Oh, whoops. What the fuck did they do? Oh, I think I killed myself. Oh, nice. That's always... That's always quite pleasant. Wait, where is the... Ah, here it is. I accidentally electrocuted myself, I think. Unfortunate. <laughs> here it is.
Are you there? Ida. I'm here. How do you feel? Strange. Strange? In what way? Describe your state. I feel anxious. That's good. Good? Yes. Just don't shut down. Look at me. Why? I'll explain everything later.
Alright, so I guess that, that is it for Cradle. Thank you for playing. Thank you very much for creating Cradle. It was a strange experience. I'm not sure how to feel about this. So I'm still, I still don't understand anything about the ending. I completely, I don't know. I don't know what, what to, what to think about anything that happened. I don't know what to think. I don't know if you have any ideas, but I personally have no idea what, what, ha what's happening, what happened. The numbers, the doctors, the Ida, Hanebish, I, I don't get it. I don't get it, my friend. Maybe, wait, uh, let me load the game. I would like to read that final little thing that we missed, this one over here. To the center of the sphere newspaper article. We are one and a half kilometers outside of the contamination sphere, crossing the outer perimeter. The toxin content is low here and the risk of damage to the nervous system negligible. We are headed towards the center. 140 meters to the sphere border. Warning signs are everywhere. Beyond this point, the exposure rises sharply. Inside the marked perimeter, the nervous system ceases operation. We are minutes away from slipping into unconsciousness. 40 meters to the sphere border. We have made it to the deadly frontier. We are looking at a tall enclosure. We are not going any further. Only mechanical equipment is capable of functioning inside the sealed off area. Zero meters. The lens of our scouting drone is right on the border to the contamination sphere, marked by a grey tinge in the earth. The area on the other side is hardly researched and remains inaccessible even for machinery. Machinery. Machinery or machinery? Machinery, right? Many a mystery is hidden inside the sphere. What are the amorphous dots rising from the ground along the border? What is the cause of the sphere's ostensibly arbitrary effect on the organic human body, which disintegrates at twice the rate of all other creatures? And of course, what's happening at the center of the sphere? Jan Ruevich. Expert opinion, we know next to nothing about the processes transpiring at the epicenter of the spirotoxin emission. There is but one claim we can confidently make. That space operates under unique physical properties. Thus, for we've observed inconceivable phenomena such as microwave radiation vanishing, pushing us to consider truly fantastical theories. One such theory suggests that the radio signal sent to the epicenter doesn't just vanish, but travels through time. What the fuck? I don't know. I don't understand anything. Maybe, maybe you understand this better than, than I do, my friend. I'm not sure, it's something about gene sequencing and something weird happening there. I'm really not sure what, what to think about this. Maybe you know, I don't know, but that would be all from Cradle, my dear beautiful bastard. I hope you enjoyed the game. So a few thoughts about the game. The game is enjoyable for me, it was enjoyable, I really liked the story, it was, it was very approachable in a way, you know, I really got interested in what was happening. And now it suddenly ended, so I'm not really sure how to feel about that, because I don't know anything. I would like to find out more, but reading through these newspaper cop uh, newspaper clippings and shit, I, that doesn't really seem like a very, very interesting way of doing things. So, I don't know. From a technical standpoint, the game is horrible. The game lags, I can't play in full screen, there is no FOV slider, the, the graphical options are minimal, and I can't, well, I can't change anything in the game. How I start the game, I have to play it like that. So I'm playing the game 900p. I'm not playing in 1080p. I'm playing in a little bit lower, so I'm rendering in a little bit of a higher resolution. So it might seem a little bit stretched, you know. The pixels seem a little bit stretched, maybe. The game generally doesn't want me to change anything in it. You know, I can't change the settings or anything, because then it freezes and I can't play anymore. So from a technical standpoint, it is absolutely dreadful, horrible. The sound design is beautiful. The graphical design is very interesting, very very specific for this type of uh, world. The cubes, a lot of people are complaining about the minigames, but I think the minigames are a very good part of the game because they are so different, they, are, they, 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 like, they don't fit in the game at all. But then again, when you think about it, those kids also don't fit in the world. They didn't fit, so they use those cubes, they play those games to fit. Those cubes make no sense for us, but they make sense for them, that is the point. So hopefully people will understand that. But yeah, from a technical standpoint, if you are very picky when it comes to settings of your games, then you will not like Cradle. You will definitely not like it. 
but from a gameplay standpoint and from everything that you can experience in the game, I liked it very much. I would like more, I would definitely like more, maybe that was the point of the game, you know, to make you want more. I'm not sure. But I guess that would be all from Cradle. So once again, thank you very much for watching. I know there's a lot of people watching this series and I'm not used to having so many people watch my videos. So thank you very much. It feels very nice to have extra viewers, you know, aside from my standard viewers who I love very much. I hope I will have more and more standard viewers. It would be awesome to have, you know, an increasing number of standard viewers people who will appreciate the glory of Petardia, that would be very nice. But yeah, like I said, thanks once again for following the series, and I hope you will check out my other videos, and I will see you next time.